Second Kings chapter number five is where we're going to be for our scripture reading this morning. Second Kings chapter number five. And would you join me in standing for the reading of God's word? As we turn to 2 Kings chapter number 5, aren't you thankful for the faithfulness of our God? The Bible says that Jesus is faithful and true. 2 Kings chapter number 5, and if you don't have a copy of God's Word, these verses are on the handout that you received on your way in this morning. 2 Kings chapter 5, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. In verse number 1, we read, Now Naaman captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the, Assyri- and the Assyrians had gone out by companies and brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is in the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed, and took with him ten talents of silver, and six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for uh, the service that we've enjoyed together so far, for the music. And now, Lord, we pray that you would bless uh, the preaching of your word. May you use this passage to bring about change in our lives. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, today we begin a brand new series entitled Courageous Faith. And we're going to be studying the lives of men and women in the Bible whom God used to courageously serve him and to make a difference in their generation. And this morning, we're going to learn about a teenager who was a foreigner, uh, who was a servant, and yet she was willing to speak, and God used her to make a great difference in her generation. Now, we live in a very noisy world. There's a lot of noise out there. And uh, we had a noisy night last night in our neighborhood, and we had some folks a few doors down. They were having a party. They were playing that music. I'm talking about the kind you can feel, you know what I mean? And it's just uh, those boom boxers, whatever, going. They were going, you know, about 10, 30, about 11. I, I lay down. I thought, you know, surely they'll stop after a while. And, and uh, they kept going and going. And Man, it was midnight. And I was thinking, do I need to go over there and talk to those people? And it's probably not good for a pastor to get in a fight on a Saturday night. You're supposed to be nice to people and stay in a good spirit, you know, and so I kind of kept praying that it would go away. I think it might have been one of the deacons of our church. I'm not sure, but it was over in that direction. That's a joke if you're new to our church, but, uh, but anyways, it was over in that direction, and, and uh, finally about midnight, oh, finally the noise went away, and, and uh, we, were, we finally got to sleep, and Terry and I were laying there in bed, and I guess it was about 3, 3.30 in the morning, and all of a sudden, I thought I heard something. Terry jumped up, and she said, Paul, somebody's knocking on the window of our room. I thought, what in the world? I loaded my 45. I started walking around the house like Barney Fife, you know, just trying to see what I might be able to find. And, and I did all my investigation and to the best of my ability to understand, a pine cone had fallen off a tree and bounced on our roof down to the ground. <laughs> it was a noisy night last night. We didn't get a lot of sleep last night. And we live in a noisy world. Road traffic, they tell us, the noise from road traffic has been convincingly tied to heart disease. Uh, Chronic noise exposure increases both the levels of stress and also the stress hormone cortisol. And people that spend a lot of time on the roads honking and vying for position, that stress can build up and it can have a physical impact on their life. A constant low-level barrage of meaningless sound is uh, demonstrably bad for the brain. No, No matter what they tell you, you can't listen to rock music all day long blaring without having a negative effect 
on your psyche, without having a negative effect on your life. And especially, they say, the developing brain of a young child. It's very detrimental, that loud, constant noise in their life. And so we live in a loud world. We live in an angry world. And people are constantly speaking with various different voices. And someone might wonder, well, with all the noise and with all the voices that are going on out there and people screaming about uh, their anger issues and false reports and false religion and all of this, how can my one voice really make a difference? There's already enough people flapping their thoughts. There's already enough people making noise out there. How can my message and my voice ever make a difference? Well, today we're going to learn that God indeed has called us to speak the truth in love. He has actually commanded us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And we're going to learn a lesson from a girl that may have been 12 years old, and yet she had boldness to speak for her God. Now, every chapter in the Bible has a little background and something that needs to be known in order to get the context. And so let's think about that very briefly. The nation of Syria was to the north of Israel. Her capital, Damascus, is still a strong and dominant city to this very day. I have stood many times in the Kenetra Heights of Israel and looked across the United Nations tents and into the country of Syria. I have seen Russian fighters come right to the border of Israel and then pull back. It's a place of tension in the modern era. And yet throughout history, the Syrians and the children of Israel have had battles one with another. And it was no different at this particular time around 800 BC. Elisha was the prophet in Israel at this time. And there had been many battles. Sometimes there were battles between the Assyrians coming all the way from Nineveh down upon the Syrians, and then many battles between the Syrians and the Jews. And it was a constant thing. And we learned that during this time, Elisha was serving as the prophet of God. Syria had been endeavoring with many battles against Israel. And in the midst of all of that, there arose up a military leader in Syria whose name, the Bible tells us, was Naaman. And Naaman was a mighty warrior. And Naaman was a man that was used to conquer the Assyrians and to bring many victories even against the Jews. But when we read about Naaman, the first thing that we learn in verse number one is that there is in his life the presence of corruption. And I want you to notice this this morning with me. It says in verse 1, Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. All right, let's say that last phrase together. But he was a leper. So notice the reputation of Naaman, the reputation of Naaman. Naaman was a great man. He was a captain of the host of Syria. More than likely, we would refer to him as a general. He was a national hero. He was a great man. Uh, The Lord had given him victory in battle, and he was pleasing to his master, the king. He had this great reputation. If he would have walked into an assembly room, everybody would have wanted to know him, to salute him, and to honor him. But notice not only the reputation of Naaman, I want you to see this morning the problem of Naaman. The problem that Naaman had, but he was a leper. Now let's take a few moments and talk about leprosy. Not a very great subject, perhaps someone might say, but it has a spiritual significance. Leprosy is a real disease. Naaman was a leper. It is a chronic infectious disease that is highly contagious. This is something that you never wanted to have, especially in those times. The the medical field did not know how to treat the pain. There was no cure for this disease. It led to certain death. And no one really knew what to do about the problem. And so they would oftentimes take those with leprosy and literally remove them from culture. And literally Naaman was facing not only the loss of his military rank, but his place in society if he could not get this leprosy dealt with. 
Many of you perhaps have been to countries where leprosy is more prevalent. Some of you have visited the Hawaiian Islands. You may have heard the story, the true story, that the island of Molokai was a leper colony. For many, many years, no one was allowed on Molokai. Only the people from Hawaii who had leprosy would go to Molokai. And that's sort of how the world has treated lepers. Get them out of here. Send them away. Uh, Keep them away from us. And so it was that perhaps Naaman was facing such an ostracization. I remember years ago, having the privilege to be one of the first civilians to see the mighty uh, F-35 fighter out at Edwards Air Force Base. And uh, I was invited to go see it, and, and they said, now we want you to enjoy the tour, we're going to walk you around. And, and uh, they said, but there may be people working on the fighter, and there may be some things that are classified that you should not see. And so they said, uh, Pastor Chapel, we want you to hold this light. And it was sort of like a light that a fire truck would have on the top. You know, those red lights goes round and round, said, a little handle on it, said, we want you to hold this uh, so that people, when they uh, see you coming by, if they need to cover something, they'll be able to cover it. And so uh, I remember thinking how strange it was to not have a security clearance. And in fact, when I would walk by some of them, I would say, unclear, unclear. You see, that's what the lepers did back in these days. They would walk through their village and they would say, unclean, unclean. Uh, They were not to touch anyone. They were not to be around anyone. Leprosy was a terrible problem. Warren Wiersbe said he was a leper. His beautiful uniform and his mighty victories could not disguise the fact that Naaman was a dead man, for he had a disease that no one could cure. Leprosy is a real disease. Leprosy also is a picture of sin. And we need to understand that today. It is a picture of sin. In fact, in the Bible, in Numbers chapter 12, when Miriam opposed Moses, the Bible says that Miriam was stricken with leprosy. Right here in 2 Kings chapter 5, you'll find that the servant of uh, Elisha, a man by the name of Gehazi, after Naaman is healed, tries to obtain money from Naaman. And God strikes him with leprosy. So sin is always associated with leprosy. It is a picture of sin. And so the Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is what? Death. Spiritual death. Physical death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now leprosy is loathsome. It's a terrible disease. Leprosy defiles. Leprosy will take someone's hands and slowly eat away their fingernails and then their fingers and ultimately someone's entire hand. Ultimately, leprosy will kill someone. I want to tell you, my friend, sin will take you farther than you ever thought it would take you. Like leprosy, it keeps eating away at you and eating away at you and destroying your conscience and destroying your family and harming your testimony. Sin and leprosy go hand in hand. And this is why Isaiah said in Isaiah 64 and verse 6, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy what? Rags. All of our righteousness are as filthy rags. The connotation there is a rag that someone might take to to cleanse their leprosy, to take the coagulated blood that was itchy and bothersome and to wipe it with a rag, a filthy rag, a medical waste. And God says, my righteousness is like a filthy rag. In other words, I can't come to God and say, God, let me into heaven. God, give me your blessing, because after all, I'm a pretty good guy, and you know, I give to the March of Dimes, I'm a nice neighbor, I give snacks to my dog at night. God, I should make it into heaven because I'm a pretty good person. God says, no, your best is like a filthy rag. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, the Bible says, putrefying sores. Naaman was a great man, but inside of Naaman, he was rotting to death. Inside of Naaman, there was a problem that was taking his life. And we might look at athletes who can dunk the basketball or win a gold medal, 
And we might look at certain business owners and such, and we might say, wow, look at them. They are great men. They are great athletes. They've got it all together. Look how they walk. Look at their car, how it shines. But I want to remind you of something this morning. We live in a world full of leprosy. Every man and woman and child, no matter how good they might look outside, has the problem of leprosy today. We are all lepers, and the Bible is clear that there is a sin problem in this world. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And sometimes people try to pit one race against another to create racism for their political purposes. But let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says red, yellow, black, brown, and white. We are all fallen sinners. We all have leprosy today. Say, well, that's a very negative sermon. I'm not coming back next Sunday. You know what I've found? You don't appreciate the good news till you really understand how bad it is. We can't get this idea like, boy, God's, God should be glad I'm in church today. All cleaned up. You know, they ought to be glad I'm here. God says, your best effort is like a rag full of pus. This world is a world of leprosy. All have sinned. Naaman, a great man with a great problem. Notice not only the presence of corruption, secondly, notice the proclamation of truth. This man needed a serum for his sickness. This man needed a cure. And the Bible says in verse 2, And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Now notice the person that God is going to use. Notice the person that is going to have the courage to speak. The star of the show is not Naaman. It is a little slave girl. She is a captive. She is a POW, a prisoner of war. Maybe 12, maybe 13 years old. And the Bible tells us that she is the servant of Naaman's wife. She was a foreigner. She was in a land with different food and a different language and different culture. She could have become bitter. She could have hated Naaman. She could have wished him to go to hell. She could have desired the leprosy to bring great pain upon his life. But she was wise enough to know that God had her there for a reason. Are you wise enough to know that God has you here for a reason? He maketh no mistakes. Do you recognize that we are all foreigners in this world? The Bible says in Ephesians 2.19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. God says, look it, before you came to my son Jesus Christ, you were a foreigner. You were on the outside looking in. But now that you are saved, you are a part of the family of God. How many of you are glad that we are brothers and sisters through Christ? Don't come to this church and try to play your little game and put all the emphasis on your ethnic background. It's wonderful. Culture is wonderful. And food from every culture is wonderful. Can I get an amen on that? I'm praying for Mexican food at the Lamb's Supper someday. That's what I'm praying for. But what is important about us is not our ethnic background. What is important about us is that Jesus Christ has washed our sins away and taken us as foreigners and lepers and brought us into the family of God. That's what's wonderful. That's what we get excited about around here. That's the flag we wave. It's the flag of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. And here's this little maid, maybe 12 years old. And she's a kidnapped girl. She could have hated everything about her situation, but she chooses to serve God. As a Gentile, Naaman was outside the blessings of Israel. God would give the blessing through his word, and he had promised a coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. But Naaman would have nothing to do with that, just like many in that part of the world today could care less about Jehovah God or the Messiah, Jesus Christ. 
But Romans 5 and verse 10 says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Hebrews eleven thirteen. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. You see, if you're a saved person this morning, you can say, I was a stranger, I was a pilgrim, I didn't know where to fit in or where to belong, but now I'm a part of the family of God. That's why we say brother and sister, because God is our Father. Somebody say amen this morning. It's a great thing to be saved. It's a great thing to be a part of the family of God. We see this little captive. She was called a servant. She was a servant. Now listen very carefully. I do not believe that this little maid could have spoken up had she not had the right attitude. I believe she was a faithful servant. I believe she served from her heart, Naaman and his wife. May I ask you today, how's your attitude at work been? How's your testimony where you work? Are you the hothead, the foul mouth, the negative one about the boss? Uh, I, I, I'm just saying, if you're at work and it's always like, man, uh, I tell you, hey, that boss over there, he's an idiot. And they don't know nothing about safety around here. Like, I know about safety. I am Captain Osha. I know everything about safety. <laughs> tell you what we need. We need a union. Let's do that. Let's do that. Let's have a little meeting for that. We need to, we need to rise up claim our rights and you, you know I'm sick and tired of this environment in fact I'm sick and tired of California while I'm thinking about it I'm just sick and tired of all of it it's hard to be that guy and then say I got to tell you something wonderful about Jesus Christ my Savior they can look at you and go what you know Jesus Christ I would have never known I just believe this little girl was a faithful servant. I believe she was the kind of little girl that earned the right to speak. And that when she spoke, Naaman listened. Look in your notes, Philippians 2.14. Do all things without what? Murmurings and disputings. And in the Greek, that means murmurings and disputings. God says, have the right spirit that ye may be blameless and harmless as the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. We see the person God uses. Hey, young ladies here today, young men, 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, I'm going to tell you something. God can use you and God can use any teenager to help another teenager know the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ, the person God used. Notice, secondly, the permission from her authority. Verse 3. The Bible says, and she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Here we see this servant, she had a burden. Oh, I wish Naaman could go see Elisha. Oh, would God that my Lord Naaman could go to Samaria and see the prophet. He's a man of God. He has the power of God upon his life. Oh, listen, this maid may have been taken from her family she may have been taken from her culture she may have been taken from her home but no one could take her faith away from her teenagers what if we dropped you this afternoon over at the Antelope Valley Mall and there on one side were some guys smoking their marijuana with leprosy it's the sin of leprosy over here we hear some cursing why the sin of leprosy over here we have some with a terrible attitude and and uh, and dress terribly and and ungodly in their spirit because of the leprosy called sin and the question teenager is are you gonna blend in with all of that or are you gonna stand out for Jesus Christ this little girl she was gonna stand out for God she was not going to blend in with the culture of Syria. Wearsby said, had she not been a faithful worker in the house, she would not have been an effective witness. 
but because of her faithfulness, her witness was rewarded. How Christ needs such witnesses today. God is calling upon us to walk the walk and then to talk the talk. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And this young lady was going to speak the truth into the family of Naaman. She had a burden for Naaman, but she also had a belief. She had a belief that Elisha was the prophet of the one true God. She had a belief that he could remedy this problem called leprosy. And we have a belief today in what is called the era of the church. We have a belief that there is a remedy for sin. And the remedy is the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood for our sin. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh to the Father except by me he didn't say I'm one of the ways Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life we must make the proclamation God has you at Lockheed God has you in your office building God has you working at a hospital he has you there for a reason and this little 12 year old girl understood she was there as God's ambassador to speak the truth of God into that family and you are in your office building as the ambassador of God and whether you like this or not Christian friend you are the only work of Jesus Christ that some of these people in the Antelope Valley will ever know it is you and may we like this young lady point people in the right direction the presence of corruption the proclamation of a young woman who was courageous to speak finally the path for healing now there's going to be a pathway that Naaman's going to take verse 5 the king of Syria said go to go and I will send you a letter unto the king of Israel and he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and ten thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment by the way, that's the world's idea. If I give enough money, maybe I'll get my soul up to heaven. He was ready to pay the price. How many of you are glad Jesus paid the price for us? Verse 6, and he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when the letter is come unto thee, and behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God? At least the king knew that he had his limitations. He said, am I to kill and make alive that this man does send to me moreover to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, uh, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel." We notice, first of all, that the king sends a letter. Uh, they had no solution in Syria. They had no medical feat, no hospital, no cure. There was nothing that could be done. And so one king sends to another a letter. Proverbs 16, 25 says, There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. They had tried their ways, but nothing had worked. And so the king sent a letter saying, uh, let them come through. Uh, this is my desire that they would meet Elisha. By the way, our king has sent a letter and it's called the Holy Bible. And this Bible will show you the way of salvation. 1 Peter 1, 23. This uh, incorruptible seed, which is the word of God, is the letter that shows us the way. And here in this story, there is a letter given to allow Naaman to go to Israel. God had provided a solution for him. It was Elisha. Elisha would be the solution for Naaman. And the solution for us is the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1.9, who has saved us. Are you saved? And has called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. A letter was sent from one king to another. Secondly, the prophet Elisha offered his help. He said, let him come to me and he shall know that there's a prophet in Israel. Think of that. That little girl saying, 
Excuse me, Mrs. Naaman. Oh, would be to God that my Lord Naaman could go to Elisha. She knew exactly where he needed to go. She knew exactly what to say. I wonder if there was a tragedy in your neighborhood. There was a difficulty with death or the gangs or cancer or sickness or trauma. I wonder if they might say something like this. You know, that family that lives two doors down from us, they know God. Let's go ask them. That lady at the end of the church, uh, at the end of the road, she goes to that church. She'll know how to pray. Let's go seek her. I mean, I wonder if there was a trauma in someone's life in your area, if they would view you as someone to help them find the answer. This is what this young lady said. She said, I know where we can get help. And friend, if you know Jesus, you know where your neighbor can get help. It's in the Word of God. It's in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we must be courageous to share this message with our generation The king sent a letter. The prophet Elijah offered help. Notice thirdly, the prophet, he gives his instructions. And these are amazing instructions. He says in verse 10, Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. Now think of that. Number one, Elisha doesn't even go out to the general. He sends a person out. That's going to frustrate Naaman. Number two, he says, all right, if you want cleansing, you've got to go to the Jordan River, and you've got to go in it seven times. Now, I've baptized many people in the Jordan River before, and I'm going to tell you, most of it is like the picture right here. If you take a look at it, it's muddy and it's murky. There's a few cleaner spots up by the Sea of Galilee, but for the most part, it's a muddy river, and I can just see Naaman, this general. In fact, as he looks at it, he, he begins to speak, and he says in verse 12, Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? You're telling me to get this leprosy clean. i got to go in that stinking Jordan River seven times. That's what you're telling me to do. He got ticked off. He was upset at the request of Elisha. He thought, you know, look at me. I'm a general. Come on now. i got all this silver for you. Certainly we can do better than that, by the way. That is oftentimes man's idea. You know, my religion has great cathedrals. My religion has a, a great mosque. And, and I've been a part of that religion. And, and you're telling me that I've got to go do such and so? Can I tell you something, friend? Salvation is not about the place. It's about the person. Salvation is not found in a large cathedral. It's not found in a big religion. You don't get more saved if you get saved in some fancy religious building. Friend, what saves you is Jesus Christ and His finished work alone. Naaman didn't understand that. He thought these waters were below him. But these were the instructions of the prophet Elisha. Notice finally, Naaman is humbled. The Bible says in verse 13, And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father... If the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith unto thee, wash and be clean? Then went he down and dips himself seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. How many times has pride kept a man from getting saved? Well, no, no, I'm I'm Catholic. I'm Baptist. I was christened in a cathedral. I, I, I shook Billy Graham's hand. I was 79 feet from the Pope one time. I think he winked at me. I mean, I know, I know I do some partying, but not as bad as another guy at work. He's way worse. How many times has pride kept someone from getting saved? Finally, Naaman, because of a friend who said, look it, we want you to be healed, Naaman. You would have done greater things than this. Finally, Naaman humbles himself to do what Elijah had told him to do. 
to simply by faith do what the man of God had said. They did not have a canonized book called the Bible, but the prophets were giving revelation and the prophet was giving him what he needed to do in that moment. And finally, he humbles himself and he turns away from his pedigree and his self-effort and his great rivers in Syria and he does what the prophet told him to do and he was cleansed and he comes out of that river saying in verse 15, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. He said, now I get it. The God of Israel, Jehovah God, is the one true God. God had cleansed the leprosy and God had changed his life. Now you do not receive the cleansing of sin by going into this baptistry and having Lancaster tap water on your skin. It's not holy water. Baptism is not something we do to get saved. It is something we do after we're saved to show the testimony of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So how can we get our sins cleansed? The Bible says that we are cleansed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that though our sins uh, are as filthy rags, that we can come to the Lord Jesus and put our faith in His finished work and have our sins cleansed by His wonder-working power. And I'm saying to you this morning, if you are in this room and you do not know that your sins are forgiven and you do not know that you have a home in heaven, I want to encourage you today, set aside your reasoning, your religious pedigree, and your self-thought, and come humbly to the Lord Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I confess that I fall short of your glory. I am undone. I am a man with leprosy. I am a sinner. And Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive my sin cleanse my life and be my savior have you had that moment in your life have you had that turning point where you turned exclusively to Jesus Christ to be your savior let me give you four takeaways from this wonderful passage first leprosy is everywhere Say, wow, that family fell apart, leprosy. Wow, that, that young person is following a bad path. She got caught up in some stuff on the internet, leprosy. Boy, alcohol, eh, drugs, leprosy, leprosy. Leprosy is everywhere. Second takeaway, any Christian can speak the word of healing, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you are a 12-year-old girl here, you can speak about Jesus. You can invite others to the house of God to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't have to have a big education. You don't have to come from a Christian home. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what sin you've been involved in. It doesn't matter where you've been in your past. What matters is that if you are saved, God wants to use you like he used this little girl in this story. Thirdly, our king has sent a letter, and his letter is called the Bible. And in his letter, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And finally, cleansing is available. Let's say it together. Cleansing is available. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus there is a cleansing for sin and jesus christ will cleanse you if you will turn to him today